obsessions, obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt or a movie to end. Taste of cream soda, all I think about in the afternoons. You pass a finger between one tattoo and another, find that I cannot make amends with every copper thread between my ears. I believe too much in spinning around. I plant matches and pray for a forest. When I am a creature soaked, ride on my back, ride on my back. I think that deserves some snaps, at least. <laughs> Thank you. Lainey, your first thoughts? We're not, you're not doing a close reading. You're just right. giving an overview sense. Um, well, I'll just start with the first stanza. And I'm noticing that there's a focus on time and to different durations of time. So we have the time for, it takes for the glacier to melt and a time for the movie to end. So we have two different time scales. So right away, we see multiple patterns of thought happening simultaneously. Wonderful, great start. Lisa? Yes, and that, that simultaneity is also these two different scales of reality. The fact that the glaciers are melting, any glacier is melting, and the, this other kind of reality of the film, of a fictional reality or fiction itself. And I love how these two, these two entities are here in the first stanza. And um, I just wanted also to say about the very last stanza, I so am in awe of how you completely fused the, the possibility of the last stanza the, to be figurative or literal, and both. Um, and because it's very, very, it can be literal and very sexual, and it can be, um, I feel have this, you know, like like signaling back to the first to the first stanza um, to be read less literally. I'll just stop there for now. <laughs> How are you doing, Gabby? Good. This is good so far. Oh yeah. Okay, here we go, folks. And if you don't want to play the game, just say no thanks, Al. Okay. All right. So the title: Obsessions. Vijaya, you have that one. When we come back to you, all you have to do is say a word or two about what you think is going on with that word, but not yet. All right? The, th the first three lines of the poem, I'm going to ask uh, Sheridan. Sheridan, are you willing? I'm going to, not yet. I'm going to assign, assign them to you. Are you? Oh, wait, I asked you if you were willing. Yeah. Good. Thank you. You have obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt. Very interesting story. Stuff there. That's Sheridan. All right. And then the same thing uh, for, uh, for, is it Mylin? Um, that's me. Oh, that's that's you. you, yes. Are you able to play? I can't play. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Same, same. Are you willing? There's one. There's two of them. There are two of them. Uh, together? Great. Um, so you have the movie to end. You have obsessed with how long it takes for the movie to end. So the variation on that first stanza. Thank you so much. OK. And uh, Dexter, well, taste of cream soda. I mean, there you go. Taste of cream soda, all I think about in the afternoons. You've got that one. Matt, you've got you pass a finger between one tattoo and another. Good, Matt? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Um, Rick, Rick, are you willing to do fine that I cannot, cannot make amends? Okay, good luck all of you. This. <laughs> um, is it Bria? Brea or Bria? Bria, would you be willing to do, uh, w this is the hardest line, so we'll help you, with every copper thread between my ears? Uh, I just want to listen to you. Okay. So that's good. Absolutely. Um, how about Julia? Sure. You want to try that, Julia? Okay. All right. And Maribel? Where's Maribel? Hi, Maribel. Um, would you do, I believe, too much in spinning around? <laughs> I love that line. All right. I think 
Gabby has to do the next line. Okay. Uh, I have no idea what to do with that. Oh, line. really? <laughs> I plant matches and pray for a forest. I think that maybe I think you love that line. Okay. So how about Gabby and Laney doing that Sounds one? Good. Okay. All right. Lisa already commented on this, so I'm going to ask Lisa and someone else to do the last stanza. When I am a creature soaked, ride on my back, ride on my back. And I would like to ask, um, I would like to ask, I'm so sorry, Jordan, to do that one too. All right? All right, here we go. Vijaya, you have the title. Okay, sessions. Um, I think modern life is full of people having different obsessions. So you have parents obsessing about their children doing well in math, or you have children obsessing with how much of slack their parents are ready to cut them, and everyone is obsessed with something or the other. And these kind of obsessions like in the modern world are everywhere, and like everyone knows about everybody's obsessions. <laughs> and that kind of becomes kind of a common obsession with everybody because sometimes you listen to something and uh, you know on the internet or or you like you know, on a streaming video and and you kind of get obsessed with that particular thing. It could be a political stance or like an ideological or a social issue. So thank you, Vijaya. Snaps for Vijaya. That was great. And Vijaya, one more comment, please. Um, and I'll invite Lisa to add to this. It's obsessions plural. Does that refer to a general state as opposed to a particular obsession? Yes. General, a general state. state. Are we warm or cold, general I, state? I think you're good. You're doing great. great. Lisa? Obsessions. You know, I couldn't help reading the first line, like, as also as an immediate sort of um, carrying over of the title as if obsessions themselves are obsessed with how long it takes. So this, you know, potential for this doubling or this meta or this abstraction of obsessions as themselves obsessed. Because really of how the, um, the first stanza comes to a full stop. And the subject then could be read as the title itself, the subject who is wow. obsessed. Wow, you made that appropriately complicated. <laughs> Okay, so we're turning to Sheridan, who's got the first instance of the obsessions, obsessed with, for instance, obsessed with what? Obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt. Sheridan? So, obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt. When I think of obsession, I think of a very deep, very strong, visceral feeling. So, for you to be something obsessed and like have that such a strong feeling of obsession for something that's gonna take eons to do for a glacier to melt. And also when I read this line, the first thing, there's an image that I've seen in so many presentations of a glacier in water and on the top it's like surface level and underneath it's like such deeper things that are going on underneath. So that's the first thing I thought of with this. And um, yeah. Thank you, Sheridan. That was so great. I want to open it up to everyone as a follow-up to what Sheridan said. How many of you are a little obsessed with how long these glaciers are going to take to melt? <laughs> why, why are we? What is that obsession? Yes, way in the back. I'm so sorry. Yep. Um, I think it speaks to this predicament that the generation that's coming up now has been saddled with and how it's the sort of thing, if you're an anxious type, it makes it really hard to live day to day. Beautiful. Are you an anxious type? Oh, yeah. Can you, can you talk like, about I mean, you and anxious Luis type. as anxious types? And you're sure. beginning a poem called Obsessions, which is really, I guess, about love and sex. But it begins with an obsession about climate change. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a very anxious type, and I am also very anxious about climate change. Um, yeah, I think Luis and I, I don't think of this as an autobiographical book. But, of course, I use a lot of autobiographical content and then just defamiliarize it. Um, uh, Luis I've always thought of as, as kind of lower tempo. Um, I think he's a, he's a bit sadder. He speaks a little slower. Um, in my mind, Luis's voice is kind of here. It's kind of 
a little slower. And when I talk like with you, I talk rapid and I talk high and I move my pitch around a lot and I have a very sort of um, fruity demeanor. And, and Luis is more of a... A what demeanor? A fruity demeanor. Fruity. And, and Luis is sort of more stoically sad and kind of monkish and, um, yeah, a bit hermity. And so Luis is not so much an anxious type as much as he's a depressive type, but he is uh, obsessive. And one of the things that organizes this whole book is kind of repeated thoughts, like thoughts that we do again and arrive at them across what he lives for 54 years. So, how does a quick follow up question? Then we're going to go to Saint, Saint for the, the, um, the alternative obsession of this first stanza. Um, how does obsession with climate change or the, a long movie or the experience of sitting in a movie theater or whatever it is? Um, how does that lead us to sex with presumably, you know, Evan Bauer, the boyfriend? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the question for me a lot in this book is how do you get out of an obsession? Um, is sex a way out? I think so. I mean, I think you can obsess about sex too, but I think in this poem and in a lot of the love poems, there's a sense that the attachment of a romantic, erotic situation might put a breath in a thought, which I don't think is always true, <laughs> but I think mm. Louise thinks it's true. Mm. Wonderful. Saint, uh, obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt or a movie to end. That's such an interesting obsession. Um, so with reading that line, um, along with the line beforehand, I feel like, uh, like we said, we're talking about time. And if we're talking about an anxious person who always has thoughts running through their head. I feel like waiting for a glacier to melt and a movie to end are two totally different levels of anxiousness Yeah. because you know that that movie is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like it's the inevitable end that is the, I don't know the word. <laughs> that's, that's like the taker. Um, yeah. I kind of took it as like, um, what the line like, or a movie to end. It's like, we just went from for a glacier to melt, something that's kind of like important to everybody, and then a movie to end, which might not be as important to anybody. So it's from caring about something that's like this big and vast to nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's kind of just, we put ourselves through things that might not mean anything at all. Like you might not want to watch that movie, but you're still gonna wait for it to end, and you're obsessed with how it's gonna end. Like we've all sat through movies that we don't want to watch for no reason. I think you both did a great job of thinking about the other obsession, which is a rather grand one, and I think something that everybody can identify with, to this particular OCD-ness of the, oh, one of your expressions of your OCD-ness is that you, you don't, you're obsessed with how long it's gonna take before the movie ends, which is not probably commonly shared. Um, Lainey, we're about to turn to desire mm -hmm. and contact, physical contact, so before we get there, how has this obsession stuff set us up? How does it set, how does obsession yeah, set how we, us up? How are we going from the first stanza to the rest of the poem? Well, I feel like we're going from obsessive thoughts about time and temperature and you know, big global questions and smaller questions, which by the way, I feel like the obsession with the movie to end, it is a common thing, I feel like for young people, like particularly the age of my kids who are in their 20s, not, not that much younger than you, Gabby, they don't want to watch a movie. They're on their phone, they're, a, a movie's really long and challenging. Um, so there's that, but anyway. So I feel like in the second stanza, we, we're going to taste as kind of a segue to sensuality, sexuality, and I don't know if this is intended in there, but when I read that, I think of having a Coke with you, Frank O'Hara. Mm -hmm. I might rather have the cream soda than the Coke, you know, <laughs> but. So. Wow, O'Hara, are you welcoming O'Hara? I don't think I write like O'Hara, but I love that poem, and I do love cream soda, and I do love Coke, unfortunately. I'm like, I'm a soda guy. Okay. So <laughs> I mean, that's what you're asking. T TMI. Uh, <laughs> not really. There's no such thing as TMI when you're close reading a poem and the poet's in the room. Dexter. Taste of cream soda. All I think about in the afternoons. It's another obsession, isn't it? Um, definitely. And we all have different kinds of 
of obsessions. And this particular verse seems to relate to, to Proust because you've got the taste like Madeline's or sure. whatever your thing is, tea or or um, whatever it is, a tea in the afternoon with Madeline's and stuff like that. But then you also have as a love poem, you know, the taste of your lover or the taste of that being uh, an obsession, particularly when you think an afternoon delight, so. Yes. <laughs> oh, afternoon delight. Boy, Dexter, you hit all the topics there. <laughs> I had the great honor last night of, I, Dexter and I were at another event and I heard Dexter's biography, uh, and uh, let me just add that Dexter's had quite a wild life. <laughs> and <laughs> cream soda in the afternoons. Um, so, wow. Um, is Dexter right about thinking about the afternoons as sort of a sexy moment? And cream soda is kind of, a, of all the sodas, pretty sexy. Sure. Um, I <laughs> actually <laughs> literally love literal cream soda. I do want to just clarify that so I love... So this is literal. This isn't about sex. Love cream soda. Um, well, not yet, I guess. Um, I, I think we're developing towards desirous images, right? So we're going from a really anxious, like, we're going from, oh, God, when is this movie going to end? Or, oh, gosh, let's delay this glacier melting to... Uh, an, obsession, an obsession with getting a, some, a kind of satisfaction. Now, I don't think it's like satisfaction, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's cream soda, which I like. It's kind of um, sparkly drink. Also, cream soda comes up weirdly a few times in this book. The epigraph to this book is about egg creams, um, which is a drink that I don't think anybody's had in about 30 years, um, <laughs> except for maybe Al <laughs> and Lady. But um, the epigraph, one of them, is from Kevin Killian, and it's this oh, really God. weird Oh, God, Kevin haiku. Killian talking about cream soda and egg creams. It's a, it's, a, it's a little haiku that says, mosquitoes in flight, tiny wings batting the air, eggs into egg cream. And so I got really obsessed with that little haiku and how mm. egg creams don't have either eggs or cream, um, and cream mm. sodas don't have cream in them. Um, they have vanilla, and also I really like cream soda. I think Dexter <laughs> really hit, there are three somewhat sublimated topics in that one stanza, and I think he did a great job, so let's yeah, give him some totally. snaps. That was pretty cool. Okay, Matt, I'd like Lisa to help you, uh, Lisa Fishman here, um, tell us about those two lines. You pass a finger between one tattoo and another, which seems literal enough, and the story is the afternoon's events are developing, but uh, both you, you and Lisa, I hope, will talk about the sudden use of the second person pronoun you. Matt? Well, the first thing that, I, that came to mind as I was hearing it being read is how it returns in that, that passage there to those O sounds, obsessions, obsessed, how, for, or, and then we return with you and one to those and tattoo to those and tattoo especially to those yeah. O sounds. Um, I also thought about how um, uh, in the, the stanza above we have a person who should be presumably obsessed, thinking about their beloved in the afternoons, and yet they're not. Mm -hmm. And so there was this sort of disjunction between that what came before and what we're hearing here which is that we have this new person entered who is clearly obsessed with you in a different way, you know, that you might be with him. So the obsessed, the obsessed person, mm -hmm. the speaker, the poet, is now obsessed over, yeah. physically, yeah. bodily. Mm -hmm. Lisa, help us with you and add anything you want. I mean, I'm interested in the finger not tracing the tattoo or moving through the tattoo, but between them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and passing that finger between, it, it's almost, for me, it was less a, of an obsessive kind of touching and more of a transitory mapping of this imprinted image on the lover's body, um, who is, of course, the lover's body being the speaker's. And the, to back up, though, the you is so, so beautifully enters the poem here. I felt it as that, for me, what was 
the beautiful innocence and nostalgia of the second stanza. Um, just how I respond to taste of cream soda having this kind of nostalgic quality. And it as, as, as if that then laid, laid the, paved the way, opened up the space for the direct address to the you. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, to focus on that preposition at the end of that first line, I think is really important. Um, and the way that the line breaks there, that the finger is paused at that moment, um, passing between something, and that what it is passing between is, again, the literal imprint mm. on the skin. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Gabby, you want to add anything before we turn to Rick, who's going to complicate things with this problem of cannot of not being able to make amends? Uh, no, I, I, I just that for me is like an attempt at a sexy image. I, ha I have sexy. tattoos, I like tattoos, um, but it's, yeah, it's an attempt at sort of a, a sexy image. But you like tattoos, it's the other, Evan or whoever, yeah. who's actually liking them, especially yeah. now, mm -hmm. not the obsessor. Um, so you're able to displace the you-ness yeah. onto any character in these. Movies. Yeah, I mean, I also have tattoos, but not that are visible right now. But. Um, but yes, I, th I mean, I often do a thing where I kind of throw my voice at something else to let, to make it sound a little less like confessional poetry, which is... Which is not something you want. It's not something I like, it's not something I want, but I actually am interested in it. I'm just interested in turning parts of it upside down so that it looks like something else. Mm -hmm. And having started a poem called Obsessions, you're really at risk of making it confessional, so you're working hard <laughs> against confession. Rick. Uh, you pass a finger between one tattoo and another, comma, find that I cannot make amends. In other words, this is a second verb. So it's like a parallel verb thing going on. Can you help us understand that? Yeah, well, I was so I was interested in the idea of finding an incapacity or a lack rather than finding a presence. Um, I also heard obsess in you pass, and so... Say that again? I also heard obsess in the you pass at the beginning of that line, and so in the tattoos as a kind of obsession, and that going back to Lisa's note about obsession obsessed with, that obsession is obsessed with itself, that there's an, ab like an absence of any real subject of the... Mm -hmm. And in that relation, like the idea that glaciers and movies aren't really so different because almost all of us have only ever seen a glacier melting in a movie. You know, that there's this way in which the obsession with climate change is an obsession with a movie uh, that we watch, um, as well as a, obviously a reality, but the way like what encounters those things. Mm, wow. wow. And I was also just, I, somehow through the whole poem, the way that like a bunch of words in a line will seem like almost the same word. Mm -hmm. So find that cannot make amends. All to me are very, they have a, a similar sound and a similar weight. And you get that again in the end in the repeated lines, but just um, there seem for a glacier to melt or a movie to end. The parallel kind of just words and words is also mm. really. So that, that kind of obsession, like the repetition of like, you can say anything you want if you're always saying the same thing in a way in this poem. Wow. I mean, three cheer I'm going to make a meta statement, three cheers for something like the Poetry Foundation or any poetry community when people can come who don't know each other for an hour and an afternoon and do super close reading, closer than you ever expected, <laughs> and say just one really perceptive, interesting, pretty daring thing after another. I just think it's great. And Rick, what you said is a perfect example. The problem with this Lisa, Laney, Gabby, any or all of you, is that as a second, as a parallel verb form, you pass and you find. So they either aren't related, there's the very physical act of tracing or tracing between the tattoos, and then the uh, perceptual or cerebral act of finding that I can't make amends. That is to say, the lover, the other, finds that I, the speaker, cannot make amends. What possible connection, what, how does tracing the tattoos lead to this discovery of, and Rick is right to call it, a lack or an absence? Any of the three super panelists want to deal with this incredibly complicated question? Lisa first. Uh -huh. 
I'm thinking about the space between the images, that is to say the tattoo as an image, even if a tattoo is a word, an image on the skin, and that the finger, we've all, we, in a way we've been set up for it, right? Because the fingers passing between one tattoo and another, not from one tattoo to another, or not on one tattoo and then another, but in the space between, where there's not a tattoo, where there's not an image. And then the finding is of finding what's not there on the part of There the, is a connection. Yeah. Before we turn to Lainey and Gabby, possibly for further thoughts on this, there are people in this room, no doubt, who've thought a lot about tattoos. Um, is there anything about tattoos that leads you to think about not making amends? Well, there's a classic, a classic almost joke about a guy who is with a girl who has somebody else's, some other girl's name. In I'm other just, words, the, ta the old tattoo is, yeah. is something so, that is, is can't this, be changed. Is this person who is tracing, saying, well, oh, Mary and Jane, <laughs> but, you know, what about me? What about Linda? You know, <laughs> They're little, they're little history, histories. Inappropriate. No, they're little histories. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. I well, I you know, I have a certain relationship to tattoos, and I think our cultural relationship to them is changing. But they they're often um, short symbols for people's like most meaningful thing. You know, people will say this tattoo represents my brother dying, right? Like that's that would be a common. So they're little um, symbols for histories. Now, of course, the the sort of like. Yeah, the corny cartoon version is like mom, right? Like mom heart. Um, but they all kind of work in a sense like that. Yeah. For, uh, same? Um, I think that I would think it was like as literal sense as like the, just the lover chasing over their um, other lovers, like history. They just go from like, oh, what is this one about? Oh, you had this, what is that? What is this? So it's like, it's just, think of this taste of cream soda and you think of this about your lover, you just think of all of these things, good or like, like so I just think of uh, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. I think that is really great. So now, Julia, I have been really excited about this because this is a really beautiful and difficult line. You, It's the way it ends the stanza. You pass a finger between one tattoo and another, find that I cannot make amends with every copper thread between my ears. When you splice an audio cable, there's a lot of copper wire surrounding like the central kind of nerve of that cable. So I think I take it as a mechanical interpretation. And, you know, if you're if you have an obsession, you act in this compulsive way that like lacks autonomy, almost like you surrender your autonomy to the obsession. And so that's how I interpret this. That's great. Yeah. So, Lainey, Lisa, with, does with suggest that that is how, that is instrumentally how the you, or I, I can't tell which, is not making amends with such a thing? Lainey, yes? Well, the way that I read it is that the, the you is, you know, essentially tracing on the skin of the speaker. It's foreplay. And the, and the speaker is like, oh, still obsessively thinking. Like, the, the you is kind of like, oh, can you just, let's calm down and let's like be here. And, this, and the speaker is still in the, you know, the, the tangle of thought in the head. So in other words, it's not having the desired effect despite the desire on both persons' part. The speaker is mm. still, Mm. In the in the tangle of thought, which is almost like I'm imagining, you know, curls in the head, like the the gray matter is actually, yeah, like curls. That's nice. And a word that Julia didn't use, but works with the metaphor of the audio cable is connection, right? Um, Lisa, your thought about the, pre uh, the about the preposition with. Yeah, and also the preposition between in that last line too. But, um, but with find that I cannot make amends with every copper thread between my ears. 
That width is slippery. <laughs> um, you know, is it that that it is that with which the speaker cannot make amends? Is it that um, that the speaker cannot make the amends sort of causal, causally because of what is in what's just staying in this circuit in the inside of the head, mm. which is, I think that between is so charged because the first between is on the body, on the skin of the body, and then at the end, at the close of the stanza, the problem is still in the space of the speaker's head, mm -hmm. where, however you read the width, the amends cannot be made. Mm. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to Maribel in a second to talk about this next line, and we're not sure that the two are going to make love yet. We know that they do from the, it seems that they do from the last stanza, but things are kind of heading toward that direction, and obsessions seem to be, as Laney is suggesting, a hedge against getting to that good point in lovemaking. Um, so before we turn to Maribel, Gabby, how are you feeling having feeling good. This, a room full of people doing a close reading of this poem that you probably had forgotten about? No, I love this poem, actually. This is my, like, you know, I think any poet who has put out a book will be able to say that there are some favorites for, like, readings or something like that that are kind of emblematic of the project as a whole or something like that that, mm -hmm. that sell it in a certain way. Um, not literally, because we don't make a lot of money uh, but um, this for me is is it's kind of is madness is sort of badge poem because it it captures a dynamic that runs throughout this book which is that Louise who's a very sort of troubled and frustrated person like turns to the romantic as um, some kind of solvent some kind of resolving healing space and I think a lot about this thing that Lauren Berlin, who was an old teacher of mine who passed away recently, um, who was, was, talks about like, sometimes when we feel really frustrated with the political, um, which is, come on, all the time, um, we sometimes turn to our personal intimate things as like a little comfort. And so sometimes we do this thing where we're like, the world is so bad, but I'm just, I'm so glad we have each other, you know, and, and at least our home is good which actually is something I find a real comfort. And also, it's kind of bad politics because so much of what happens in your home is built by the political institutions that are around you. And so um, your, your home life is, is, is political in a, in a particular way. But, but we do a thing where we take a lot of comfort in it. And I think one of the things Luis does is like attempt to think of his relationship, which, which lasts the whole book, basically, as like but at least this works. And there's a question I think in the, in the book about is that like the right direction to put your thoughts, you know? Mm -hmm. I think there's, there, there would be a kind of like hardline Marxist version that would be like, you're looking at romance as your, as your savior from the crap of this bourgeois society and like that's never gonna save you, you're just gonna like be in a waiting room until you die. So there's like, a, there's a, I think the book has a tension of that that's, that's thinking like, well maybe that's right, I don't know, you know? And obsessions get in the way of clear thinking? Well, so the reason I say that, I think, is Luis is a very obsessive person. I'm a very, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. And like for me, I think of the, I think of United States in life as obsession making um, in good and bad ways. I think it, we get charged with thinking about the kinds of political and ecological crises that are around us. It feels impossible to not think about, I don't know, when somebody says like, oh, X really important ecological glacier has disappeared. And like you didn't know that it even existed that day, but now you're like, this is really bad. Um, uh, and we have this news cycle that's really obsessive. Like I always, I'm, I'm hopelessly addicted to Twitter. And I think about, like Twitter does this weird thing where it's like in the span of like your little computer screen, it's like funny joke. 80% uh, of Alaskan crabs have died. Um, funny joke like somebody's nude it's just like it's like it's mind-boggling it's just like it's like how can I take in all this information at once so I think Luis is a person who's taking in so much information at once and he doesn't know what to do with it and I think he's hoping 
that a lover is an interruption of that. Like it's like, let me get some quiet in the head for a second because of you. This poem is, is about that desire. And so it's, I think it, it, it says something about for the book. And that leads us to Maribel perfectly because this is a general statement that Louise is making. And it's almost a John Ashbery, uh, John Ashbery in line, I have to say. Where's Maribel? Thank you, Maribel. Um, I believe too much in spinning around. What's, said, what's being said there? I love that line. Well, I think we're leading up to having sex. I think the taste of cream soda, the person is constantly, they, they're obsessed with first. Yes, it is the foreplay, and then it is fellatio, and then it looks like at the end they have anal sex. But it looks like here you either believe or you don't believe. When you believe too much, it's obsession, and when you don't believe enough, it's apathy. So it, it sounds like there, an obs is, there is this obsession with, and I interpret it spinning around with uh, fellatio, or a hand job, and or both. So uh, Louise believe is the speaker is saying that they believe too much in that. Well, I think for me at least, like this is a poem where sex is quite in the background. I definitely don't associate particular parts of it with acts, but I do think that for me, like I believe too much in spinning around is like I have, I think that my obsessions are going to get me somewhere. Like maybe if I think enough about this, I'm gonna learn something and it's gonna resolve something for me. And so there's like an optimism in anxiety. Yeah. I think people, people are anxious because they're hoping that by being anxious, they will prepare themselves for some horrible thing that they're trying to defend mm -hmm. themselves from. That's an optimism that will lead you to bad places because actually anxiety doesn't tend to help you that much. So it's, 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 I think this is an admission of fault. Like I'm, I'm optimistic about my obsessions, and that's not going to get me anywhere. That's mm. the I believe. I think I believe too much in going, ah! You know, like that's the kind of spinning <laughs> around in my mind. Your yeah. topic. Gabby and Lainey are supposedly going to take the next line, and Lisa here and Jordan there are going to deal with the final stanza. And then what we're going to do with a very different approach is we're going to look at the last poem of the book, Tropical Negative, with its giant issues. And the four of us are kind of, kind of lead a conversation about those issues. Okay, so I plant matches and pray for a forest. Is it funny, Lainey? Well, I love it. So I feel like we were just talking about there's an awareness that obsessive thinking cannot be the remedy to obsessive thinking. There's that <laughs> metacognition. So what are we going to do if we're not going to, we're going to try some, another strategy besides obsessive thinking? And so to me, I plant matches and pray for forests. It's, it's ritualistic. It's, um, it's incendiary. Incendiary. It's incendiary, but it's also right. backwards. Because if we're anxious that we're, we're ruining the forest, mm -hmm. matches are made of wood, uh, the obvious, right? It's not going to work. A, a, a match isn't going to grow into a tree. Yet, symbolically, it feels powerful and in, incendiary to, to plant and to, and to go to kind of faith and ritual, even if we're making fun of it in the same breath, mm -hmm. it still feels very sincere and beautiful and powerful to me. At the same time, it's kind of making fun of these big ecological, you know, catastrophe. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, for me, this is a bad ritual, basically. It's like a ritual that there's a lot of optimism in, and I think it is... I think that line is is attempt is, is like sincere and it's like I'm doing this ritual I'm hoping for something out of this but it's like yeah it's it's basically instead of a seed we have a match which we associate with actually the death of a tree but it is you know a little piece of a tree plus flint and paper and things like that so for me it's it's almost like a bad expectation as a hope that I need a forest and <laughs> Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bury something kind of horrible um, that's, that reminds me of a forest, that there's an association with a forest. Um, and I'm going to hope that becomes a forest. It's like, yeah, it's bad ritual, I think. Bad ritual verging on mental illness? Oh, well, not verging because of, I think. You know, because of but, but this is a book that asks about, is, like, is mental illness the right framework for thinking about the things we call mental illness? Which I'm, you know an investor of Lexapro. Uh, I am 
totally in with my SSRIs. I like them very much. But also, now let me say the other thing I was going to say, which is, um, what if the things I call my mental illness are the product of political crises that feel unending and constant? Like some, you know, sometimes I have a horrible day and I think to myself, like, God, I can't stop thinking about. I mean, re recently, like, uh, the reason I said Alaskan crabs the other day is that there's been a problem with Alaskan crabs and they had to cancel this sort of fishing season because populations have declined in a serious way. And that, I was thinking about that for like a couple days. And uh, yeah, it's like, how do I stop thinking about this? Well, if that problem wasn't happening, <laughs> I mean, maybe I'd be obsessing about something else, but I think. I think that would be a better world and maybe I wouldn't feel that same way. So one of the things this book is doing is like, is my madness the product of my political situation? Mm -hmm. yeah, Good one question. More tiny follow up in that is I feel like the thing that's sad about that line, that line is so complicated, is that another alternative would be to kind of strike the metaphorical match and like, this is my light, this is who I am, mm -hmm. right? But instead it gets buried. Mm -hmm. So that's like, mm -hmm. it's like there's so much very different ways to read it. I think Saint wanted to add something. Am I right? Yeah, no, please. No, please. Like, as much I think it like as um, like the first line. I believe in too much and spinning around is like, like how you procrastinate with your life and like how you just over. You are, he's like he's clearly obsessed with like many things and just like. But we all are. We we think of all this. We think of all this. And it's like I plant matches and pray for a fire. It's like does that. Oh, I mean, I plant, I plant matches and uh, pray for a forest. Yeah. It's like, that's clearly like self-destructive. Yeah. It's like, he knows that he has self-destructive tendencies and like, probably going to proceed to keep doing that, but it's like, it's very just awareness. Yeah. I feel like those two lines are just very aware and it's just like, yeah. What's, we're about to turn to the last stanza and wrap up our close reading of this poem. What, you're, what this conversation is making me aware of, and I've read this book a few times, um, this is a cliche about madness, but given something like climate change and the destruction of the planet we live on, we're all kind of mad. That is, we all have appropriate obsessions. If you weren't obsessed with this, then what are you? <laughs> yeah, the opposite is not always the best option either, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what's sad is that Luis, who's thinking about these things all through his career, becomes a minor poet mm -hmm. and has to be rediscovered by a couple of fake editors and essentially you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the world of minor poets is like the world of poets, mm -hmm. period. I mean, yeah. except for about 25 of them, maybe. Yeah, that's but right. we're all minor poets working in little editions. A lot of these, a lot of the books, the fictional books are, you know, editions of 300, and they're done by a press that's run by like a polyamorous couple who falls apart in three years. You know, it's like there's that kind of, that kind of world of poetry that we live in that's just very temporary, it's very provisional, but it's run by a lot of people that I think care a lot. We just don't have very good resources. <laughs> right, <laughs> but right, we try. Right. Okay, so uh, Jordan and then Lisa. Uh, when I am a creature soaked, ride on my back, comma, ride on my back. Jordan first. Yeah, so I, one of the things that I really love about some of the comments earlier, especially about the first stanza, helped me understand this one. Um, I think that we've made it to the sex, right? Congrats. <laughs> Um, so that, you know, building of that sensuality, um, I think that's definitely a reading out of this, um, as like, you know, you're stuck in those obsessions when you are soaked in that, that sort of breath of that ride on my back, breathe in, breathe in, ride on my back component. I also saw this in the context of the climate change, the melting glacier, when we are now in the water from that melted oh, glacier. Yeah ride on my back as a way to like have someone support Save you. you. Yeah. Wow. Lisa, you want to respond to that? Yeah, that is um, that level of the less than evident literal way of reading that stanza to, um, as you've beautifully tied it to the opening image um, or notion of the melting glacier. Um, and the way that the I, uh, I'm going to put this, in, you know, sort of devolves to creature status. Mm -hmm. um, mm. When I am a creature soaked, like going back 
to through the evolutionary you know eons to when we first came out of water as well and so there's this transformation imagined um, and beautiful plea slash invitation that takes the form of the repeating line, the last two lines, um, and the repetition that the poem ends with. I was so moved by the ending of this poem and the fact that there are those four words and those four words only. Um, I felt that the, you know, the poem opens onto what I feel as this quiet, the quiet power of repetition to acknowledge failure. And I want to qual nuance what I, when I say failure, <laughs> because that is an immense power um, or moment of requiring absolute trust mm -hmm. in the fact that what you have just said, um, you cannot say another thing, a different thing. And yet the desire to say is still there. So you repeat that, which you've just mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. And I find that very, very moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And so that's so great. Vijaya, Sheridan, Saint, Saint, Dexter, Matt, Rick, Julia, Marybelle, and Jordan. Thank you. Dexter. That was so great. What do you say, folks? That was pretty great. That was beautiful.